So, uh, first of all, thank you very much for all of you for being here. Uh, this is our panel about how can artificial intelligence and education can reach underserved communities. My name is Iggy Betbitenpu. It's great to have you all uh, here, the attendees. We are uh, online on YouTube. And uh, I just would like, before I introduce the participants, the panelists, uh, I just like to bring you some data uh, that we are facing nowadays, right? We have 222 million children affected by emergency and, and uh, protected uh, crisis. 244 million children are out of school nowadays. So this is a problem that we are facing nowadays. We highlighted about the challenge during COVID-19 pandemic, but we are facing that now. We have 1 billion children, nearly half of the world's children, living in countries classified as extremely high risk to the impacts of, for example, climate change. Uh, schools in those countries are uh, every, I would say, semester grows frequently because to natural disasters, such as floods, hurricanes, storms, and nowadays challenging events that we are facing like wars and different kinds of conflicts. So we are facing different kinds of challenges. And in a very recent uh, article last week from the World Economic Forum, uh, the question, how can AI really reach under safety communities? Is that possible? Can we use AI to promote more equity and give opportunities for all? And we can take really serious the no one child left behind? How can we do that? We have a huge challenge nowadays uh, related to... Uh, promoting equity and all the tensions we face in, in, in education. So uh, this is a panel that we would like to bring this challenge with our uh, esteemed panelists. We have nowadays uh, many experts, but uh, we could have the opportunity to share with Professor Seiji Zotani from Harvard University and University of Sao Paulo. Professor Didit Rodrigues from Ateneo Manila of, uh, in the Philippines and Paul Prinzlo from South Africa. So we try to bring people from different continents and perspectives. And first of all, I would like for uh, to ask them to introduce themselves and tell a little bit what are their work about and expertise related to AI for education in other safety communities. I would like to ask, first of all, Professor Didit Rodrigo to start. Hello, good good morning and good evening uh, to everyone. I'm uh, Didito Digo, as, as Iggy said, I'm from the Ateneo de Manila University in the Philippines. Uh, the work that I do is, is mostly with trying to use um, educational interventions such as games and intelligent tutors in basic education, so that's grade school and high school classes. Um, and uh, it's it's been quite a challenge. I, I've found that um, usually uh, it, it's it's all the usual problems that you might expect that uh, schools don't have the right equipment, the teachers aren't trained, um, the uh, the curriculum and the the modules um, or the, the software aren't quite aligned. So there's a certain amount of um, work that has to be done to 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 make. Uh, the two sort of compatible, and and so and um, as Iggy said, we lose quite a number of school days because of typhoons and floods. Um, this is on normal years, not even pandemic years. So yeah, that's that's what that's what I'm doing, and I've been very um, fortunate to be uh, to be part of the artificial intelligence and education community, and which is where I met all of you. So thank you. Thank you very much, David Rodrigo. Uh, in the meantime, uh, your, you in the audience can make uh, questions, thought-provoking questions that we can discuss with our esteemed panelists. So I would like to ask now Professor Paul Prislo to introduce himself and say how his uh, uh, expertise and work related to AI for underserved communities. So thank you, Paul. 
Thank you, Ik. Uh, I think I'm at this unfortunate position, like many of us, that the more we know, the less we know. <laughs> the field is developing so fast. So my particular context, I'm at a very large open distance learning institution in South Africa. We have 380,000 students. So, and my research is focused on the use, the collection and the use of student data to help them improve their learning pathways and to support them. Personally, I find myself at the intersections of concerns about the increasing surveillance and the colonization of our students' life worlds with this data gaze. That's that's the one side, that's the, the Frankenstein side of me. And then on the other side of me, there's a side that uh, the more I know about my students, the more there's a possibility that I can care for them, care not in a paternalistic sense, but I can really identify student needs and reach out to them without taking away their agency. So I find myself in the middle ick now that we are moving towards uh, AI based with AI as infrastructure in education. I think both both sides play out in my research. The concern about the bias and the ethics and the privacy and the surveillance, and on the other hand, the the immense need, like did have said, for care and for empathy. And the more we know, we can possibly help them more. That's from my side. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you very much, Professor Paul. Now I would like to ask Sage to introduce himself, give his perspective about his work uh, about artificial intelligence in education for other safety communities. And again, for the audience, please feel free to ask questions for our uh, panelists. Sage. Thank you, Iggy. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with uh, uh, colleagues and everyone in the audience. Uh, well, my, my background is uh, from Latin America. So I lived and I was born and lived in Latin America for many years. Uh, and then I moved to Japan to do a PhD in US to, to work uh, and returned to Brazil with one single purpose, uh, which was helping people in uh, underserved communities to improve their lives through education. Uh, and I've been trying to do this uh, for many, many years. And what happens is most of the research we know in the space of AI in education, they work, they do, do they do, they do work uh, in spaces where infrastructure is available. Then when infrastructure is not available or it's poor, you can think about internet, you can think about computers and so on. When those equipments uh, are not there, then uh, we start to have problems in the space of using AI to support kids to learn. And that uh, struggle me for so many years, and I know that did it and Paul have been doing this uh, work for many years. Uh, and what we uh, in the uh, past years, what we've been trying to do is okay, how can we rethink the design of AI technologies so we can actually reach low and middle income communities uh, without thinking of uh, uh, infrastructure or uh, resources or special trainings, because all of these are barriers that uh, hinder the ability to actually use AI in education. Uh, so, so my uh, goal nowadays is trying to understand better what are these uh, barriers and how we can overcome not spending more money on infrastructure, but is spending more money on people and 
in the redesign of technologies that we can actually use in that space. So hopefully we can have a good discussion about what are those challenges, uh, what those challenges are, how we can overcome then ideas that we can move forward. So I'm really happy to be here. Hopefully we can share more ideas and really end up with uh, good potential actions. So thank you. Thank you, Iggy. That's great. Thank you very much, Seiji. Uh... Well, we're gonna now have some uh, a round of some uh, questions uh, from in and from the audience. But before that, I would like to to summarize what you said. So, did it uh, focus to highlight uh, the challenge related to teachers and curriculum, Paul, uh, broader perspective of data infrastructure and ethical concerns nowadays, and you brought the perspective of people and rethink the way we are designing and implementing AI ED to reach low and middle income communities. So very complementary when we think about the uh, theory behind the digital divide we face. So in the first level, first of all, we have the, the level of attitude and motivation, the second related to infrastructure and digital skills, which is quite complementary about the perspective that you brought here. So my question for you uh, is how can we really rethink the way we can work with artificial intelligence and education to tackle the challenges we face nowadays with the barrier of or the digital divide. So I would like to ask uh, first uh, for Paul, how is his perspective, for example, related to data infrastructure or ethical uh, concerns and, and the digital divide? And so how can we think about data infrastructure and ethical uh, ethics, AI ethics in the low and middle income communities to tackle the challenges we face nowadays. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. And I'm so glad Didif and Seja is part of the panel. They can add other perspectives than the one I try to bring. I think just three remarks when we talk about the digital divide Ick, that I think uh, that is very important for me. I think what, what COVID illustrated is that digital inequity or inequality or the digital divide is not located only in the global south. There's also a global south in the middle of New York, in London, in Bangladesh. It, it spreads. So it's not an African or a global south or a majority world problem. The digital divide is spread. And I think that is what COVID illustrated for us, that we were all in the same storm, but we were very, very specifically in different boats. The second thing when we're in, when I was thinking about this, this uh, panel, I think when we talk about underserved communities, it is almost uh, important for me to say they were left out for a reason they intentionally underserved. Uh, and, and from my perspective, that intentionally underserved can be because they have no commercial value. They could not contribute to the economy. They have no value for the venture capitalists that would install digital infrastructure. So what we now see on the African continent is now suddenly with our booming youth population, is suddenly there's a new consumer public arising and is very important for venture capitalism and, and AI companies to enter the African market, market in a data gaze. So, um, so having said that, I think talking ethics, I think three points. Um, it's more than access. And I so love what, what Seiji said, uh, even if even if those underserved communities suddenly had all the infrastructure. Data poverty is much more nuanced and the possibility of AI to make a difference in their life uh, depends on the affordability of the access. Having access is not enough. The affordability of the access, often they don't have a choice. They don't have a choice of a variety of products so they not they 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 are basically faced with one pro pro product. There's they don't have the the uh, money to get a VPN, a private 
network provider, uh, so they lack private internet access. So uh, privacy comes at a cost. So it, it's a danger that when these underserved communities become part of this, this bigger network of algorithmic decision-making, that they are not protected. And then the last two things, they often lack digital skills, and then uh, their language and their communication needs for the people with disabilities or long-term conditions are often excluded. So I think we, when we talk about the digital divide, I would like to bring this to Dedef and Sergei to say, providing the infrastructure and providing access will not erase the digital divide. The digital divide is much more complex. And lastly, sorry for this long answer, uh, uh, AI cannot so solve structural inequalities on its own. AI is not the so this solution that the gods gave us or give us. Um, so we cannot absolve political, economic uh, forces. Uh, so we have to account. So with that, thank you so much. Uh, and um, I look forward to seeing how it links to Dedef and Sergi and Ik, you as well. Thank you very much, Paul. That's an amazing answer. I would like uh, now ask Sage to complement and give his answer and perspective. No, fantastic. Uh, I love what uh, Paul brought to us, uh, which is infrastructure is not enough, and uh, this divide is there, and AI is not the silver bullet. And uh, uh, it's interesting to think about uh, uh, the, the the challenges uh, and AI in education in 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 a broader view because doesn't matter what kind of technologies we develop if we don't have uh, a good match between pedagogy and technology or AI technology, we are still going to have the same problems we are having uh, right now. So with technology, without technology, is going to be the same problem. Uh, so there is this mismatch between AI and the use of AI together with uh, pedagogies or different teaching approaches that we actually do not pay much attention. So you don't see too many, a lot of work on that space, like exploding uh, work together with AI. So this is one thing that uh, we need to consider uh, in that space, following what uh, Paul have said. And the other thing is, when we are thinking uh, AI technology uh, for education in underserved communities, I think it's interesting to bring at least five elements that uh, we need to consider. First, we were discussing about the infrastructure. So we need to consider the available infrastructure instead of building new infrastructure. Uh, the second one is uh, use or consider the use of internet only when available. So we cannot think that we are going to have like this internet everywhere, uh, even with the Elon Musk satellites like running around. So we need to pay attention to this. So internet in most cases will not be like widely available or with a big band, a uh, broadband. The third one is we can think about a proxies, which means that maybe the AI solution will not actually reach the the uh, the target user, but maybe someone in the middle will play a role, an important role in the process. Let me think about, for example, uh, you want to reach a student, but to reach a student, maybe an AI can use a proxy, which can be a tutor or a teacher or a, a, a uh, a person who is caring about the, the that particular student to reach out to the, to that student. So you can put uh, uh, 
uh, one element that we didn't discuss, which is the human factor together with the uh, with AI technology. So we are enhancing our capabilities to do good. So I think it's important, especially when you are thinking about vulnerable uh, population, which caring is really much important. Uh, uh, so this uh, human touch is extremely important. And finally, uh, I, I think uh, I know there is a big movement about uh, digital skills, training uh, people with digital skills, but for uh, underserved communities, uh, I would say or I would argue that pushing for digital skills for them is not the best way to go. Maybe it's better for us to create a technology that they can use without uh, training them in digital skills because it will reduce the barrier for them to use or get benefit from uh, technology and, and uh, improve their lives. So if we ask them to, okay, to gain some benefit, you need to train yourself, then you are leaving people behind. So I, I hope we don't well, we don't try. Uh, what can I say? We don't do that. So uh, that's is my long answer to 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 your question. But I, I think it's really interesting for us to think about all these issues. And I know, for example, that work with uh, that did it do with uh, these extreme situations with hurricanes and floods and we can think about okay so if your city was devastated by a hurricane how can we keep education moving forward or we need to like stop for six months until the infrastructure then then start uh, learning again so uh, uh, with that I'll leave you uh, the the word back to you Iggy well, thank you, Sanjay. With that, I will leave the, uh, the, the word to Didi to answer your question and the thought-provoking uh, comments about uh, Bo as well. And thank you, yeah, Didi. Thank you. Thank you to to Paul and to Sanjay for their comments. Um, I wanted to, you, your question was, how do we address the barriers? And I wanted to latch on to the thoughts of both Paul and Sanjay, which is to, uh, just to uh, emphasize that infrastructure is not enough and that we can't um, solve uh, technology. AI is not going to solve structural inequalities. So, um, what I what I'm trying to work on um, now is to try to focus on the teachers, and this actually springs from much of of uh, your work, yours, uh, Seiji, and yours, Iggy. Um, the I, I, I very much like that idea of working through a proxy because expecting students to have their own devices, to have good internet access is not really realistic in our in our context. But maybe if we can invest in what I think it's UNESCO calls the um, teacher-facing technologies uh, to help our teachers um, to, to take away maybe some of the the uh, the, the very labor-intensive aspects uh, of of teaching and the what and the ancillary tasks that teachers perform, um, maybe that will will get us more mileage. And I was talking to a friend of mine who is um, a public school teacher, and I and I've looked at some of the descriptions of their work. And aside, uh, so about forty percent of their work of uh, is on, on what's what they call ancillary tasks. And these include things like uh, managing the parent-teacher relationship, um, filing the school improvement plans, um, and, and so on and so forth. And, and it takes up, they, they've classified those things into, um, into tasks that are, in kind of, that are very time intensive and tasks all the way up to tasks that are relatively light. But uh, so I've been reading the job descriptions, and some of these tasks actually do lend themselves to automation 
not necessarily AI, but automation nonetheless. And and one of like, for example, um, a lot of our poor schools have feeding programs for their children, and it is up to the teacher to monitor things like um, which child is lactose intolerant, which child is um, is is allowed to be to participate, who is not allowed to participate, etc. And then. They have to monitor the weight of the students um, throughout the feeding program months. Uh, and, and so, you know, all these things are, are um, currently, I think, they do this manually. Uh, they fill out all these forms manually. So I think those things can, uh, those you can imagine, take hours of their lives. Um, and so, so I, I guess what I'm thinking is that there might be low-hanging fruit by 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 looking at teachers' tasks, identifying these low hanging fruit, and giving them support to 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 be able to address these low hanging fruit, uh, that might free up time, and uh, so that they can focus on on the teaching and learning. Um, and and so yeah, so, so I guess we have, but but ultimately. Um, if the the success of such interventions will depend very much on whether they have administrative and structural support. So if the structures, the school policies, the the resist that kind of change, then even if we have the best technology, the best AI solution, it's it's not going to it's not going to take. Thank you, David. That's very interesting. Uh, one thing that you all said is AI is not a silver bullet and the challenges are everywhere. Under, when we are talking about underserved communities, it's not talking about only, only about the global south, but under, underserved communities in all of the world, which means we are all on the same boat trying to tackle the same challenges. Uh, but one thing that I, I, I could observe in common about your, you said is, uh, it doesn't matter if it's data po uh, poverty or uh, proxies to tackle the challenge or administrative support. It means we are talking about people, human capital. And it's also related to the question that Isabel Hilliger did uh, in the Q&A, which is uh, related to the first comment about Seiji. She said, interesting tension raised by Seiji between resource and technological infrastructure. Could you elaborate more on why to invest more on people? That's the question that I would like to ask not only Seiji, but all of the panelists. And also, I would like uh, to ask you, what in your view is the low-hanging fruit to tackle the challenge of underserved communities as uh, did it raise? Seiji? No oh, man, you left the question, the hard question for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, but uh, let us think about, at least in my view, why people are uh, are so important in this process. Uh, you can imagine, as Paul said, you can imagine that you have the best infrastructure available. And my question is. Is that sufficient or enough to have good quality education? If the answer is no, then it's not a problem of technology. It's the problem of uh, pedagogy. Uh, so now we can think about <clears throat> the process, how policies, education policies are usually created. For example, most, uh, uh, every, uh, almost every country I've been, most of policies in the space of educational technology, uh, they start with the infrastructure. So you go to any country and you talk about with policymakers about, okay, so what kind of policies you are developing to uh, support students to use uh, some kind of educational technology and people will talk about how they are 
creating policies to improve the infrastructure by computers, provide internet, and so on. Uh, so they start with infrastructure, and then they think about the uh, resources that can be used with that particular infrastructure. For example, uh, some kind of uh, digital books, learning materials, uh, and, and so on. Uh, uh, open uh, uh, OERs, open educational resources, uh, re uh, resources. Uh, and then they start to train people, teachers, staff, students, to use that particular uh, uh, infrastructure, materials, <laughs> to achieve something. And then they think about what to achieve. Okay, so everything that we build is going to help the teacher or the students to achieve better learning gains in mathematics or literacy or so on. And what happens is, is people need to uh, try to use this uh, infrastructure to support learning somehow, and they do like this Frankenstein thing. So you don't know how to use it, you receive some kind of training, uh, but it doesn't fit well with your pedagogy, but that's okay because you're using that infrastructure that uh, government spent millions building. <clears throat> you see how, how problematic this is? And the question I ask is, okay, what is the vision of education? Why this infrastructure has been created uh, uh, in the beginning, to begin with? So if we cannot answer this, maybe you need uh, another kind of technology, but you bought another kind of, uh, I don't know, you bought like a digital blackboard and actually what do you need is just a projector. What the hell? Uh, so it's important for us, at least in my view, to start from the vision. What do you want to gain in terms of learning, in terms of productivity, in terms of pedagogy? And then you start to train people. That's why people is, uh, for me, in my perspective, more important than anything else. Because with that vision, you train people and you nurture them with the, that particular idea and vision about education. And then you create resources to reach that vision. So you create particular tailored resources for that particular vision, for that particular people. And finally, you, you use resources to create infrastructure to reach that vision and not the other way around. So if we follow that flow, I think we are going to be in a much better place and people will be much better, how can I say, value, uh, because they are at the center of the process and the vision about what is education, what do you want about education, is what drives everything else. So hopefully, uh, this process can be uh, taught with or without technology. Going back to what did it and Paul said, this is uh, AI is not a silver bullet. You use AI whenever needed. And if we have this process that starts from the vision and the people, then we are actually going to use only AI whenever needed. And now, and not using AI because it's fancy, because it's interesting, because it's chat GPT answer all the questions, right? So sorry for the long answer again, but that, that's uh, why people, I think why people are so important in this process. Thank you, Sage. I will, I will, since you highlighted that, I will ask a question to David and Paul is, uh, we are not talking about AI to deal with all of the challenges in the world, but try to understand people, pedagogy, resources, and infrastructure, but on top of a problem. So my question to Paul or Didith uh, is, 
what in your perspective are the challenges or the big challenges we face nowadays in education that maybe we can use this approach and you maybe use AI to tackle specific problems like are we talking about personalization or uh, lack of uh, uh, excuse of students to personalize? Are we talking about teachers absenteeism? We're talking about teacher quality. What we are talking about? What are the main problems that you believe uh, we are uh, we have somehow an opportunity here to work with AI? Did it, Paul? And, and, and just to add on that, Rafael asked. How could we use the power of generative AI to reduce this digital divide in education? I think it's related to the to your question. And Perfect. we can so, think about okay. Can we Go think ahead. about tensions that we have nowadays and maybe the opportunity to use generative AI to tackle those problems? I leave to you, Paul, and did it. <laughs> I don't know that this is, the, I don't think that was an easier question. <laughs> it's a harder question. <laughs> Okay, well, um, uh, okay, I, I, I really um, buy into what Seiji said about um, looking at pedagogy first. Uh, in, in, I would add to that, okay, context. Um, so I come from the Philippines and are uh, in the last three international exam, so that's the TIMS, there was a Southeast Asian exam and the uh, PISA, we ranked, if not the lowest, second to the lowest, something like that. So our English, math, and science skills are among the poorest in the world. Um, and so what I would, um, the, the approach that I would take is uh, to look at maybe what the least learned skills are for uh, of the students and because the, the exams i believe break those down um and and then i think you would need to do sort of this deep dive into how these these skills can be taught in an effective way um which is an entire i mean you know there there are volumes and volumes written on this uh so so i'm not going to even attempt to to go down that rabbit hole uh, for now. Um, but to, to jump now to the generative AI uh, question, the, one of the other problems, the, the reason why our, our, one of the reasons why our school system is so, is so bad is because we lack teachers. We, we really do. Um, and we, we have, it's not, uh, it's quite common for, for teachers in our classrooms to handle 60 students uh, in, you know, and schools are overcrowded. So they have the shifting system where some students come very early in the morning, then another shift comes in the middle of the day, and then another shift comes late in the afternoon. And, and you know, that's, um, that's a difficult, those are difficult conditions in which to learn. So I think that um, there is an opportunity if, if for, for, to create these maybe AI-based teaching assistants of some kind to help students with with develop these fluencies because because our math skills, I mean these are math skills of grade four students. We're talking about relatively basic arithmetic here. Um, when you when you speak of language, it's reading sentences, understanding meaning, um, uh, noticing details, you know. So the, these are not we're not asking them to do calculus or you know, so I think that some some practice, give, giving them interesting word problems to solve, giving them interesting bits of text to read, um, asking them questions about it. These are opportunities for generative AI, and I, I really hope that the, the, technical, the technology can go in that direction for these types of learners. Thank you, David. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Paul as well about generative AI, but I will add a question that Brando Snyder asked which is related to generative AI, which is, do you think there are ethical ways to employ under communities to contribute to training and validation of AI models? So my question is also not only about generative AI, but the ethical uh, part on training those models as well through under communities. So Paul, thank you. Oh, wow. That's, that's the, 
that's a privilege of being lost in the queue. The questions are just added and the levels of complexity just gets more. Uh, just briefly in response and trying to make the links to Sergey as well as Didov, I love the sequence, uh, Sergey, of, of, of people and pedagogy and then think resources and then infrastructure. I would like to add a C before the people and that's context. I think Dedef said uh, the, her specific context. So we have to consider the very specifics of the context and then say, what are the pedagogical problems in that context? Who are the people? And then continue. Uh, I'm from the continent that uh, the UNESCO Education for All Education Monitoring Report in 2023 it said 64% of primary school teachers are undertrained on the African continent and 50% of secondary school teachers in sub-Saharan Africa have received minimal training. So that's that's a reality. Three uh, free short responses. Firstly, I do think we are faced in a new liberal economy where governments withdraw funding from public ex uh, education uh, and the schools and education institutions are faced with the issue of doing more with less. Uh, our classrooms are overcrowded, our teachers are undertrained and underpaid and overwhelmed. So I do think we should not absolve governments from the social contract with the population. When governments withdraw their support and financial support and close teaching colleges, we also see that venture capital or private capital moves in and what Naomi Klein calls disaster capitalism. So there's a disaster, there's an opportunity to privatize education or privatize a school. And of course, with all the bells and whistles and the price and the underserved become more and more underserved. That's the second point. The third point is, so what do we do um, what are the potential for challenger? What are the potential for teachers? I would say that if we can pay our teachers better, if we can train our teachers better, and then think about generative AI. But the first two is not going to happen soon. So, so and, and getting back to Sergio, I think generative AI can really play a role for the proxies, can really assist for the proxies, for the teachers, not necessarily for the students. But then again, I think that's very important to consider that the uh, current models of generative AI is trained on, trained on training sets from data from the global north. So there's biases, there's cultural biases and stereotypes and all of that. So we cannot just embrace generative AI as this, this, the solution, uh, uh, the silver bullet, as was mentioned. The second thing is I do think we need to develop local generative AI models in the languages, in the contextual issues faced in that local context. So um, personally, I... I do think, in the words of Luciano Floridi, that we see a reontologization of, of the world and of epistemology through AI. And I'm really concerned about what is happening on an epistemic level and even an ontological level. But seeing that we are here, I would suggest that, yes, generative AI can help, but we we scholars and intellectuals in 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 institutional institutions or in uh, educational institutions have a burden and a responsibility we cannot abdicate our responsibility for peer review for validating knowledge claims to an ai we should not it's unethical so my finally we should ask not if ai can make a difference and if ai generative ai can help I would say, under what conditions, what should be in place for generative AI to really help us serve the underserved? Thanks, Ik. Thank you for the amazing answer, which is, uh, we are almost in the end, uh, and I would love to have another hour to discuss, but I will, I will try to do an exercise with you here. Let's think you are in front of Audrey Azula, which is the director general of UNESCO, or in front of a minister of education and policymaker. 
Uh, and they are asking you, which recommendation do you have for me with the budget I have available to improve learning or dealing with the challenges that we have nowadays? And if we should, or if we could use any kind of AI solution, what would that be? Uh, or just in general aspect is, what would be the recommendation that you would give to Audrey Azula, the general director, about the whole hype that we are facing nowadays related to AI? Uh, maybe, did it? you can start. Um, I, okay. You know, if, if I had the answer like right now, I would say um, back to basics. Uh, and, and I think this is a theme that has been echoing in this in this discussion that um, maybe not not jump to technology right away, but uh, actually, understand context learner teacher curriculum and where the gaps are and then ask the question is this something that or what interventions are needed and some of those interventions might be ai and some interventions might be blackboards and classrooms and chairs um so i think that that would be my thought so thank you Thank you very much, did it, uh, Paul? Uh, shortly, I, I think the notion of educational triage is very interesting. Uh, uh, triage is from the First World War where the medics walked through the battlefield and had to identify and classify the wounded. If you were very wounded and on your way to Nirvana or heaven or uh, Hades, uh, you were sort of, it would take too much resources to, to rescue you. So they would classify patients into beyond redemption and uh, near death, and those that need a lot of care and those that with a little bit of care can go back to the to the trenches. And I do think that's uh, the, the dilemma that educational ministers or ministers of education face is how, where to, with the little resources we have, how do we go to the most vulnerable, the most underserved, or do we go to those communities that with a little bit more help can, we can move, we can change a generation to come. I think that's a dilemma. Personally, from my own perspective, I would like to go to the most underserved, to reach the most vulnerable and to see, and then to go back to what Seje as well as Didov said, to work with proxies. If we cannot reach the most vulnerable, who are the closest to the most vulnerable and spend our resources there, that can make a difference. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Seje? And uh, <laughs> that opportunity, I would say that uh, The current problem is not a tech one, it's a, a cultural problem. And don't try to push solutions from one place to another. Instead, work with locals to build up a solution for them, by them. And I think it, this is really powerful uh, because we've seen, we've experienced several times uh, decisions made by uh, UNESCO, United Nations, being pushed towards uh, uh, low-income countries or middle-income countries that do not have the power to fight back. And, uh, for example, this case of infrastructure is a decision from the top. And this is a huge problem because you... Uh, do not see the real struggles and problems that they didn't Poe were saying. And you will have to follow an agenda that is not necessarily the one that's going to solve the local problems. Uh, so this is one thing I would say. <laughs> uh, the, the second thing is about, you said about the hype of uh, Gen AI, uh, generative AI uh, technology nowadays. And Following the questions of uh, uh, Raphael in the beginning, 
is nice things. Generative AI can be used offline. Very few people know about this, but you can use offline. So you have models that can be downloaded and use in a, uh, not a power of comp a computer, a, a, a normal computer, a laptop that you have. And thinking about these uh, uh, underserved communities, you actually, by using these uh, uh, technologies, you can enhance creativity because in in most of those, those places, one of the challenges is how you uh, make students to think outside of the box. So you can increase creativity of students, you can open their mind. And most importantly, you break one important barrier, which is, is the barrier of access because not only you can type and talk with for example uh offline chat gpt but you can also uh allow people to speak without knowing how to write uh these technologies are all available uh, technologies of uh, ai technologies to extract information from voice, from images, from anything, and talk to us and build knowledge with us uh, in a way that it wasn't possible uh, a, a few decades ago. So I think it breaks all the barriers of the digital divide if we, we use wisely. And being careful about the bias, the risks, uh, uh, out there, but uh, allowing people to use, I think, will make a huge difference in underserved communities. So the way how to uh, having this friendly communication makes a huge difference uh, in terms of gain the benefits of AI technology in in. Uh, in, in the particular communities. So I, I think that's it. So let me stop talking. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess we have five minutes. I would try to summarize some of the amazing uh, things that you said. Uh, first of all, I would like to say back to basics, right? Uh, I like when David said that uh, we are trying to deal with so many complexities, but we need to back to basics to understand what is the, uh, the problem we are facing, what we have nowadays that can support our decisions. And let's start in back to basics. The second one is uh, maybe we should prioritize uh, those who need it most. Uh, and uh, Paul highlighted that, and that's exactly the view of UNICEF. When UNICEF uh, said the key priority is to ensure that digital learning, including AI technology, supports children in emergency and children outside of the formal school system. We need to focus on those who need it most. Uh, work with locals, co-create, do not promote, propose a top-down solution. Do not come with an agenda to force it to be implemented. Try to listen those in the context to learn from them and co-create solutions, not only impose from just experts with the solution already in their minds. Don't forget the role of government. We as a civil society, we also have to think how we can work together with government, with the market and all of the stakeholders to deal with the complexity of this challenge. Uh, think about work with proxies, as Sage and Paul highlighted. And finally, context, people, pedagogy, resources, and infrastructure. Let's do not, again, focus on trillions of dollars to build infrastructure and then think about pedagogy and people. Let's think about the other way around. Maybe that's a good way to, to rethink and redesign and re-implement policies in a way that we can reach under saving the community. So uh, I just would like to ask you, Sage, David, and Paul, to give just a final, not only comment, but 
a call for the audience because to take all of this challenge, even if we have low hanging fruit, we need everybody. We need the expertise and cooperate with all of the community. So if I would like to, uh, I would like to ask you one very tweet uh, due to the time we have and ask for the audience. Uh, what would you say uh, for them to ask them to join this effort of improving the world or uh, change the world to reach under safety communities and to promote education and opportunities for all? Sage would like to start. Yes, just in one tweet, uh, for the research community, stop having a research agenda and let's try to solve real world problems. If we can do so, instead of choosing a particular AI topic or AI technology, we actually aggregate the knowledge we have and build upon this to actually solve problems of society, and as a side effect, we also uh, improve or move forward uh, with the uh, knowledge of our community. Thank you, Paul. Oh my goodness, that's a tall order. I, I do think we have to break the cycle of intergenerational underserved communities. Uh, that should be foremost on our agenda is how do we prevent their vulnerabilities from becoming pathogenic? And then back to Sege, start with the people, start with the context and build the solutions from bottom up. Thank you very much, Paul. David? Uh, I wanted to just well, one of the terms that, that I've heard is hereditary proletariats. <laughs> but anyway, just to, to describe your uh, the same phenomenon that you're referring to. But oh, okay, uh, my my I guess my call to action would be um, to try for, for us as a community to design for for constraints, um, not for blue skies, but for constraints that are um, that that. I think all of us here are are very much immersed in. Thank you. That's amazing. Uh, well, we are just in the end of uh, our panel. Uh, I just would like to ask you uh, in the audience, uh, we are all in LinkedIn, David, Sage, Paul, they, they are amazing researchers and uh, amazing vision how we can improve the world. So reach out then. And let's work together, uh, maybe try to understand the challenges we face in the world together, cooperate with those in the, in the field, and then uh, let's somehow try to change the world. Thank you very much. Again, Sage, David, Paul, and the audience for all of the questions. And I hope to, to discuss with you in LinkedIn and others uh, uh, places as well. Thank you very much.